Mother Goose, you look through the keyhole, seeing if anyone has opened this door recently. You see some scratches from use. This, this chamber can be accessed. There are, there are people that can come through here. Um, you even see inside of the tumblers of the lock, a little glitter, maybe some fairy dust. Looking through the keyhole though, you see brightly illuminated the chamber within, which you actually can get on a knee and look through the keyhole into the chamber within here. A vast shrine, enormous sweeping staircases, platforms, all composed of glorious pillars of text and parchment and books and scrolls, and at a tall pedestal at the very top, swirling and hovering in space as though weightless, is a perfect glass inkwell, and ink flows and spirals out of it, covered in light. Something profound. As you gaze at it, almost awestruck by what you behold, you see something within the ink. And on a nat 20, I will ask here if you want to divert away from the ink to continue to look for sort of like signs of damage on the lock or signs of like entry or anything like that. Or on that nat 20, if you want to peer deeper into the ink at the center of the shrine. Deeper into the ink at the center of the shrine. You stare into the ink and you think about how often you've been able to write these sort of perfect poems, these things that just feel so right, exactly as they should be, going into your book. Where has that been coming from? You've been a witch your whole life, but you never felt a magic like that. Like the universe was confirming something while you were doing it. You didn't have to wait until after to know that you did the right thing. How amazing, how incredible to know that you were doing the right thing in the moment of doing it. What a gift and what a rare thing in lands as troubled as the never after. And you stare in that ink and really quickly, it's your whole field of vision. You don't need to see the keyhole, the peripheral light. You don't even need to see the rest of the shrine in there. Just that ink fills your whole vision. And you start to feel so good about the things you've done right that it's hard to notice at first that you're trembling. Suddenly you start to feel a little flat, a little bit like maybe the most important things about you are things that uh, have nothing to do with who you think you are. And you feel a sort of thundering emptiness, a deep, profound shadow. And you wonder if perhaps you and everything that's ever happened to you and everything you've ever cared about is pretty frivolous. There are things looking at you and they're real. They're real and you now understand how terrifying that is. They're real and you're not. And you were a fool to come here because now they can see you. And if they can see you, there's nothing that can stop them from doing whatever they want to you. And now you know your whole body is shaking, but what the hell is a body? That's not anything. That's an idea, it's a joke. And you're nothing more than scratches of ink on someone else's piece of paper. At the moment where you realize that eyes vaster and more powerful than your entire universe are beholding you, that's when you hear, Timothy, and you snap back. All the better to eat you with. What? And here you see the grandma gets up, the sheets, the cap, all of it falls away. And somehow without this cottage getting bigger, you're looking at a wolf that seems to tower in this space 
like some ancient monument. Its gaze is completely neutral. It is enormous and powerful, and it rests on the bed. There is a hum expectantly in the air, like something is supposed to happen. Something is supposed to unfold in this space. The wolf said all the better to eat you with, but it makes no motion to leap at Ilfa. In fact, you notice that although it towers over all of you, it is lying down on the bed. I bet you on the path. What did you do? Where's my grandma? I've eaten her. She is in my stomach now. Why? I am a wolf. OK, well, the woodsman's going to come along, and he's going to show you the sharpest side of his axe. Perhaps he will. Time passes, and all of you watch Ilfa standing here waiting. Hours turn into days. You actually feel the turning of pages as you watch Ilfa stand, waiting for the thing that, at this time, she just had an inkling was supposed to happen. But now you know, all of you, the feeling of, yeah, this version of Ilfa's story went really wrong. Went really, really wrong. You see an Ilfa who is shaking and almost passed out from just exposure, dehydration, lack of food, having been frozen in this moment of terror for too long. The wolf has regarded you still as stone this entire time. After this small eternity, the wolf looks at you and says, you are dying. No, I'm just waiting. If you cannot eat, you will die. This is the law. What would you have me do? Go to the fireplace and there pick up the axe by the wood that rests at its side. Come to the foot of the bed, raise up the axe, and split my skull. When I am dead, Eat of my flesh, and you will be strong enough to wander the woods on your own and return home. That's ridiculous. I, no, no, I, I don't even think I could lift up an ax. That's not, that's, I'm just a little girl and a nice one at that. No, no. The woodsman is not coming. He often comes and stops by. If we just keep waiting, I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. This is not my place to even have any part in. I told you, my teeth were made to eat you. And one day I will. So then eat me, so then just eat me. Then just eat me and get it over with. It is not your time. So it's my grandma's time, but not my time? Yes. Well, I don't trust you because everyone told me not to trust you. So if I can't trust you, then what you say isn't true if the woodsman is coming. So I will turn my back from you to the window to behold the entrance of the woodsman. Do as you will. Ilfa, you go to the window and look into the woods. What do you think you see there? I think by... I think that's sort of probably like, because of hunger, it's just kind of blurry. And I mean, I don't see the woods bed. And I think if anything, I maybe see like a bird swooping mm -hmm. in and like eating a worm or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I don't see the woodsman. And I probably wait here until like my personality 
kind of fades and I'm just hunger and I'm just animal. And then I sort of think that it's like the instinct takes over and it's not, not really Ilfa doing it. It's just something deeper. And then at that point, I think I pick up the ax and uh, maybe there's like a moment as I'm about to do it that I kind of realize that once I do this, I'm never going to be able to undo it. Um, but then I think that gets drowned out by my stomach and I probably just heave the ax over and kind of dead-eyed, split the wolf's skull and consume his flesh. In the moment before the ax comes down, the wolf, who has sort of had his chest proudly up like this, lays his head down like an animal going fully to sleep and flattens his ears against his head as the ax comes down. <laughs> All of you watch Ilfa with hands and teeth rending into the wolf's body and eating, face covered in blood to stay strong, and see the blood of the wolf coursing through her veins. And as this memory of your friend leaves this place to go to the cottage where her mother and siblings await, where we know what they will do when their monstrous daughter returns. Dad, I can fix it. I can fix everything. Something's gone seriously wrong. Will they leave through the back door? You are now simply standing in this cottage, empty, the bed soaked with blood, but no wolf nor girl here, save for Ilfa, your companion once again, who is with you. And you are all standing in an unfinished, or should I say, mostly erased story. There's parts of the sky that are just not there. And when I say not there, I mean, when you look, you don't see a blank page, you don't see void. It's just, you can't quite look there as you Watch in this space. It's the feeling of a word I'll bring back all the way from our first season of making the show together. It's a little bit of a palimpsest, a thing that has been scrubbed. You are looking though at a place that even though some of the lines and outlines of it are strangely gone in a way that makes you nauseous and uneasy, a home that you recognize from a previous life. Cinderella's home. You behold a different time, though. You hear the ringing of distant bells in celebration, and you see running, screaming from a flock of birds, two young women holding their bleeding faces as the birds peck out their eyes and uh, peck at their faces and peck at their throats, running and screaming. And you see a woman go out and try to throw a thick blanket over the two daughters and cover them and you see the face partially there you see something's tried to erase this as hard as it can something powerful and pinocchio you feel a deep attachment to this you recognize the magic here this is a story that was attempted to be erased not by them but a character tried to erase their own story, or perhaps tried to consume their own story. You see this woman rush out, throw a blanket over the two daughters, and then there's a leap forward, part of the story erased, it jumps forward in time, and you see the mother tending to these two deeply injured women, and she says, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I love you. 
Your stepsister is the princess now. She is not going to, if she is decent, going to allow you to live in misery. I will find a way to fix this. And you see this woman addressing a prince and princess. This Cinderella does not wear armor. She is still in her gown. The woman says, given that they were so grievously injured by the birds that seem to help you, your highness, whensoever you wish them to, I cannot help but wonder if it does not fall to the prince and princess to see that they are helped. You see Cinderella looks at the stepmother and goes, I am sorry that they are wounded. I am sorry that they have been injured. Respectfully, I did not cut the toes or heels from their feet so that they could fit into a glass slip. I knew that you were jealous. You are a spiteful girl. I am sorry I cannot help you. You see the stepmother thinking by a fireside and then saying, there are those who can help me. I will save my girls. You see her don a cloak and ride out on a horse. And you see long days of travel. And you see this woman who was spiteful and cruel to Cinderella, but it cannot be argued that she did not love her two daughters. A woman who seems possessed of some conviction or determination, as well as some degree of spite, but astride this horse, you see her in deep snow, in a deep and ancient forest. She says, there are those who know, there are those who know. I will find why this has happened. And you see her arrive at a small cottage in the woods. And as she arrives, she is suddenly very frightened. The cottage stands on two chicken's legs. <gasps> oh my god, this is... <laughs> you see that the woman gets off of her horse and says, hello, my name is... A seam opens in space as she says her name that you cannot hear. I've ridden far, long way. I asked all I could, though it made me seem mad or a fool, of any witches that might know the secrets of healing or might know why our lives have come to such ruin. And I was told to come here to the greatest witch of all. The cottage uneasily shifts on its chicken feet. And right behind the woman's ear, a voice goes, you have come far. And a woman hovers out, flying in a giant stone mortar, kind of rowing with a pestle, is an old and ancient witch looks like some primeval spirit of the forest. And here she is rendered in explicit detail. It seems that the reason you are able to perceive this story at all, despite all of the attempts to erase it, is that the story exists in the mind of this witch and she will not allow anything of hers to be erased. Completely, at least. So, you have come far to this place, riding on your horse. What is it that you seek? You see, the woman says, help, understanding. I'm a proud woman. My daughters are badly injured and hated in our kingdom, as the princess is quite beloved. And the story has spread far and wide. Her side of the story about how she was treated. You did mistreat her. What? Of course you did. You are a wicked stepmother. It's not a wicked stepmother. I did not say you were a wicked stepmother. You are a wicked stepmother. Don't you know? 
Amen. If you will agree to give me one favor of yours, binding, maybe I tell you why your life so rotten. Not understanding the ways of witches, you see the stepmother agrees. Baba Yaga, ancient and most powerful witch, looks at her. I give you something now which will break you. Because you have asked for it. And let this be a lesson to be careful what you ask for. And you see here that Baba Yaga shows and you can see the light of text and parchment on this woman's face. And you see her awakening as all of you did to this reality. Why are you showing me the story of my stepdaughter? This is the story you are from. Well, show me my story. <laughs> you don't have a story. You don't even have a name. Yes, I do. I do have a name. No, no, no. You might have a name in yes, some frivolous way. But it's not important that you have a name. It doesn't matter that you have a name. You want to know why your life is ruined? Do you want to know why you hate your stepdaughter? You hate your stepdaughter so that we can love your stepdaughter because the crueler you are to her, the more we like her. This is what you are. You see the stepmother goes, I don't even have a name in my own story. I don't even have a name in my own story. And my own story isn't even my story. I don't know how I feel about that. Maybe I do. Who makes these stories? Where can I find them? You want to find them? You will have to sacrifice much to find them. How about I start with my name? I so clearly don't need it. And you see the stepmother takes a knife, plunges into her chest, and blood splatters all over the page in front of you as you see the stepmother not move to the next edition of her story but move out, move out beyond the world, move into the spaces between worlds. You made me to be evil. You made me to be a monster. And I never had a choice. Every bad thing that happened to me was planned from the start. I don't think I like your story. I don't think I like any stories and you see this blood red ink grow and see other versions of Cinderella, other versions of these stories. And you see her reach down and pick a little illustration off a page and eat it and start to move through the lines between. Doesn't matter, I'm not even really a person, right? and you see her begin to move through these texts and parchment and pages, having ascended to a higher reality. As that happens, you see her growing greater and greater and vaster and vaster until she starts devouring stuff that's not even a Cinderella story anymore. You see she's gotten powerful enough she opens Snow White's book, sees an evil queen with a huntsman. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Devours it. And you remember a mirror in a carriage telling you to talk to the stepmother. All of you in this space see her moving 
and suddenly have the awareness that you are moving quickly towards the present of the stepmother's story. Rosamond, um, as you begin to fade, you are fully dead, and you, as your sort of life is leaving your body, you see Thumbelina's face looking down as the light leaves from you. She looks down and says, Princess, is it your time to rest? Or do you want your story to continue? I don't think it's my time to rest. Then I think I <laughs> Coming from the wound in your body, briars seep into her eyes and begin to pull her brain out of her skull. <laughs> And her skull and tiny body is split in half as this version of you seeps into the book and you call and devour a darker version of your story. You come back at one hit point, Thumbelina is dead. 